Good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule, not to mention so close to a Friday. I'm Chelsea and I handle the account side of things at Cami. And today we're going to have a fantastic panel on breaking digital barriers, where we'll be talking about some of the new best practices regarding your school or organization's learning experience during this whole COVID pandemic. And we'll be focusing on strategies to help create a positive learning environment and breaking down some of those barriers you might find while working digitally. So regardless of your particular role or industry, the purpose of this panel is to give you something, hopefully a new idea, a fresh perspective, or a new strategy that you can then apply um, to boost general well-being in your environment. So here's the rundown of how things will go. We will give each of the panelists a few minutes to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their background. And then we've got a few questions for each speaker to kickstart a discussion about their experiences, navigating some of these high level challenges and trends that are arising in today's world. And specifically when it comes to mental well being in the workplace. So if that sounds good to everyone, let's meet our speakers. And Dr. Sydney, if you would like to go first. Wow. Okay. Thank you for, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to you know, share some insights from my experience in, in, corporate, in corporate, quite frankly. Um, I am uh, in New Zealand. I was the general manager, uh, chief learning officer for Air New Zealand. So that was a exciting opportunity for me. Uh, a big part of what I did was transforming learning in the workplace. And that is basically um, digitizing and democratizing learning so that uh, the information that people need to do their jobs and to develop themselves is available for everyone throughout the company. So that's the long and short of my responsibilities and has been in previous um, companies. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. And Mark, you're next. Awesome. Good day, everybody. Mark Sparvel here. I'm a, a principal and a education leader with about 25 years experience working globally. I'm particularly interested in how we lever technology to humanize learning, not just to digitize curriculum content. Uh, currently, I work for Microsoft Education and I focus there on supporting schools and systems as they engage in transformation. And that's not just digital transformation, but that's people transformation. So looking forward to, to hearing from uh, the panel and learning from everybody at Kami Connect. And next we have Stacy. Hi. Um, my name is Stacey Roshan, and I work at an independent K-12 school. Um, I am the Director of Innovation and Educational Technology at Bullis School, and I have the chance to work with teachers K-12 on really intentional technology integration. And I think, to me, that is the most important part, addressing the why first, and getting to how we can use technology to really build deeper relationships. Um, many of the things that Mark was just saying, I believe that we can build stronger connections, get to know our students um, on a more intimate level, know their needs, know class needs, pre-identify a lot of information so that we can target exactly what our individual students need. Awesome, and last but not least, Eric. Hello from Houston, Texas. Uh, my name is Eric Scheninger. I'm a former science teacher and principal from New Jersey. And I was the person that did not believe in any of this stuff. And I did everything I could to create a culture that was about conformity, compliance, and control. And then when a student in 2009 thanked me for creating a school out of what, uh, creating a jail out of what should be a school, everything changed. That and getting on Twitter. Uh, I now, for the past seven years, work for the International Center for Leadership and Education, and my role is really job embedded, ongoing professional learning that is research based, evidence driven to really help teachers, leaders, schools, and systems move forward to create a culture where learners can thrive no matter what is thrown at them. 
Awesome. Well, hearing all of your guys' backgrounds, it's great to have you um, a part of this panel discussion today. And we will get started. One of our first and probably biggest question is what are some of the most critical challenges that tend to disrupt people's learning experiences at work? And particularly with the COVID shutdown, with the pandemic, what was the most critical challenge? I know in my personal life, my first challenge, March 20th, I got laid off. And I was laid off all summer until August, until I found Cami. So that was my blessing and um, what led after that challenge. So for you guys, what do you think was the biggest critical challenge, whether it was in the corporate world, in the education world, um, anything that you think was a challenge? Um, I'm happy to, to jump in on that one. Um, and just to kick that off, I guess looking at uh, the impact upon educators, on teachers and school leaders of 2020, was really having to deal with ambiguity, uncertainty and complexity and deliver on a role. And one thing we know from neuroscience is the brain doesn't mind a bit of stress. It's designed for stress and how to react to stress. That's why emotions were invented as a biological response to dealing with stress. What the brain doesn't like is the brain doesn't like being out of control. It doesn't like uncertainty. And certainly for all workers, particularly for our education workers that I focus on, when we've talked to them about the impact of 2020 upon them, they've talked about burnout, they've talked about stress, they've talked about professional losing the protective factors of their colleagues wrapped around them. And largely they've talked about having to navigate complexity, ambiguity and uncertainty while still trying to deliver a uh, you know, a critical job. Yes, and it's that part that still you have a job to do regardless of what's happening. So how do you kind of navigate all of that? Does anyone else have a critical challenge that they think everyone had to go through? Well, I, I'll speak from what we did at Air New Zealand because I think um, maybe, and to pick up on what Mark is saying, I think the ambigu ambiguity around uh, what's next and also what's the next right move because off, at least in corporate in the corporate world what's next as a result of covid happened to be to your point chelsea you know workforce reductions and um that was just a you know unfortunate situation as a result of covid but what we tried to do in terms of um creating um putting putting some support systems around the the uh, eventual outcome, which was workforce reductions, how do we create a soft landing for our people? So we know what we're gonna have to do, we're gonna have to make those tough decisions, but how do we create that soft landing on the other side of that? So that was somewhat of a challenge for us, try to figure out how to do that. And so what we did was we partnered with nonprofits, the government, other corporations. Once we knew what that workforce reduction would look like, who, what were the populations to try to connect, the, you know, bridge that soft landing or create that soft landing with other companies so that we could um, usher the employee into that next right step for them. So it was somewhat of a challenge, but because of the nature of this country, let's, let's start with there, start with that, um, we were able to unify um, corporations, government, nonprofit, universities even, um, to help create a, a soft landing for, for our people. Perfect. And that kind of pushes its way into my next question, which is what advice would you give to leaders to best support their teachers or their workers in difficult situations? So maybe Stacy or Eric, you have some advice or something that may have worked this time around that you want to make sure that we embrace and um, have to avoid having those challenges happen if anything ever happened in the future? You know, I, I think we have to really embrace the lessons learned and be weary of going back to the way we had always done things. And I think the pandemic has really disrupted what we've done. And, you know, we think about all the different challenges from, from equity to no one being prepared for this how we use time, 
the social emotional uh, aspects of learners and adults. You know, but but as I think if, if we look right now, it is, you know, what are those opportunities? Uh, those opportunities to really rethink what we've done. And let's use equity, for example, prior to the pandemic from a, a pre-K through 12 uh, lens, most education was all kids doing the same thing the same way at the same time. Now we can turn that into an opportunity. We've seen it with how we use time, where now we can move to more personalized approaches through blended pedagogies, where we can focus on all learners getting what they need, when they need it, where they need it. And by all learners, doesn't matter if they're preschool, high school, or adult. And, and I think the future is bright because we do not know what's down, gonna come down the pipe. But two things are certain. If we want a future-proof learning for all kids, we need to empower them to think, and we need to have them apply their thinking in relevant and meaningful ways and understand that time is fluid. I love that. And Stacey, do you have anything to add that you think? Yeah, I feel like we have been in this emergency response, um, a very stressful situation for a full year now. And, you know, none of this has, um, none of the situation, though there have been opportunities, I think there are opportunities for what's to come. I feel like what happened is that we needed this emergency response too quickly and that's not the way to design any lesson right so like for me as a teacher most of my success has been because i've done a really slow intentional rollout even when i talk about flipping my classroom like it was an eight-year process to get to where i got to where i felt really good about it and i think that slow intentional redesign of lessons starting with why you're making the change leads to really incredible outcomes. And we couldn't identify problems to then build solutions. We kind of had this problem that was an immediate need at us. So I'm excited about the work that we have to do next, which will be taking some of the things that have worked really well, thinking about that we also have to get rid of some stuff, you know, and just finding and really thinking very intentionally at this next step what do we want to keep why do we want to keep it how has it transformed our classroom for the better and now i think we'll have the time to actually do some of that lesson redesign which is a very important part and i think that's going to bring a lot of success that made you maybe some teachers who are struggling right now just haven't had the time to do that yet because frankly like there was not the time yeah everyone was in survival mode of just doing what they could do and a lot of people are working remotely for the first time. Um, so what has been the best approach to breaking down some of those digital barriers that may have hindered teachers connection with those um, students? Well, um, Chelsea, oh, sorry, you go, Eric. Well, I mean, stating, I think the obvious that we all agree is uh, prior to having breakout rooms, it was almost impossible to have discourse and collaboration in remote environments. And I remember going into a school in August and they started the year off hybrid. And I'm there, I'm watching the face-to-face -face learners, remote learners, there was no conversation. Now they're on breakout room fever. And, and I think what we've learned is learning is learning, good teaching is good teaching. You know, as Mark referenced, you know, what we know about the brain, you know, brain research is giving us more insight on the strategies to utilize. But when we think about pedagogy, you know, cooperative learning, differentiation, uh, you know, we're not project based learning. We're not, we should not move away from that. And I think that now we're seeing in a remote space as people become more and more comfortable, we are able to use these effective strategies to not just engage, but empower learners. I'll turn it to you, Mark, because I know we kind of were, uh, voicing over on each other <laughs> no worries I, I think both all of the speakers said something really interesting before as a segue to to this bit which is they kind of picked up there was almost these phases you know there was a respond phase which was largely about can we communicate can we deal with health safety in many cases for schools can we keep our students safe and fed but then we're they're in this the the reflection phase. What what have we learned? What have we learned from the past? What have we learned from the the far past that we need to cast forwards? The the good practice, the the evidence based insights that Eric's alluded to, and we take those to reimagine the future. Um, 
when I was speaking to a group the other day about, you know, what's really important in life between the glass that our learners are experiencing, it comes back to stuff that we know to be true, that all students, in fact, all adults need to be seen, to be heard, and to know that they matter. And that doesn't matter if we're face to face or between the glass. We need to construct our, the social learning environment so that people feel they're seen. I see you and you matter. They know that they're heard and that they know they have some kind of control going back to that sense of how do we best deal with people in trauma situations, in situations where we feel uncertain. The way we deal with that is we give them some control. We give them some autonomy. We give them some choice. Thanks. Yeah, of course. And some of the things I was thinking of just now, like now that we've done that reflection piece, we know what works. What were some things that didn't work? I know not a, people don't like talking about things that didn't work or um, kind of unsuccessful things, but I'm curious to know what are some techniques or things that didn't work maybe in the corporate world, Dr. Sydney, for you or in the educational world for the rest of you? Well, I'll say, here's the thing. I think that <laughs> Actually, before COVID, I think most people knew what wasn't working, but because there was no sense of urgency or there was no pressure to accelerate those changes, I think they just kind of, you know, laid dormant, if you will. And as a result of COVID, um, it kind of galvanized and, and put some fire under some corporations and, and also K through 12 to, to get moving on what they knew needed to be changed anyway. Um, what didn't work, I think, at least from a corporate standpoint, is most organizations, at least corporations, we have a business continuity plan. In an emergency, you do X, Y, Z. So that's more of a recovery. If it happens, then this is what we're going to do. What I think <laughs> we need and what should have been done and what we discovered is you need really a prevention plan. Things are going to happen. And in general, there are many, many indicators that tell us that things could have happened. Like there were signs that COVID, we didn't know it was gonna be called COVID, was happening. Uh, there are signs and you know that there are places that are earthquake prone. You know there it may happen. Are you ready for that? So I think this was, um, you know, an opportunity to see that, you know, the business continuity plan didn't work as well as uh, you know, we wanted it to work. And what we learned from that is we need more of a prevention continuity plan rather than a business recovery continuity plan. Um, and that way, I think we could have, at least for from a corporate standpoint, I'm not just talking about Air New Zealand, I'm talking about many other corporations who I've had the opportunity to talk to since <laughs> as a result of this is, um, doing a much job and that helps with the uncertainty back to mark's point it helps with the uncertainty if people know that in the event of an emergency we have measures in place to prevent to the maximum extent possible for example workforce reduction or impact on our assets or impact on our revenue or impact on our performance so for us and in my experience and what I've learned in terms of what didn't work and what we learned and what we should be doing in the future, that's what I would have to say about that. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else have anything to share that they learned didn't work? Well, I would say, I would just add, oh, sorry. No, 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 go um, ahead, go ahead. Just super simply, I would say that I feel like in a lot of ways, we're clinging on to synchronous. Um, and I think there's a lot of power in the asynchronous. I think this both in the work world and in education, Eric talked about the power of the breakout rooms, you know, just like getting there took a while because you were used to in the classroom, I need to be in control. You know, I heard a lot of like, well, when kids go into breakout rooms, I'm not going to know what they're doing. I'm not going to know if they're paying attention. I'm not going to know. And so we need to give students like that opportunity, the choice. We need to allow them to take ownership for their learning. We have to build trusting relationships with them and then we have to trust them. And then when something's not going right, we need to be there to support them. So we need systems in place so that we're able 
to follow up and have this loop. But I think there's real power in the asynchronous. And I fear that we have clung on in a lot of ways to everything needing to be synchronous. So at first, when we all went remote, you know, you were doing a little bit more asynchronous, but then it was like, all right, let's just have a Zoom meeting. Let's just have a Zoom meeting. Let's just have a Zoom meeting. And I, I think there's potential to continue to explore the power of asynchronous. And I'm just going to add a few quick things to complement what all of my esteemed colleagues shared. But what did not work? Piling on too much work, posting assignments with no plan for feedback, providing just digital options, traditional grading, low-level paper worksheets or low-level digital worksheets, abiding by a traditional school day or the way which we always did things, forcing teachers to follow traditional school day, and covering the entire curriculum. And I'll just stop there. But those are some things that really didn't work before COVID, but uh, were exasperated uh, during the pandemic. That's awesome. I, th I think you've kind of covered that entire punch list there, um, Eric. Um, Stacey, I think what you said was really interesting. Um, and, you know, this is an opportunity where learning can be untethered. You know, it's untethered by time and place for the first time. Uh, and that's a really interesting opportunity. I mean, it brings uncertainty into that mix as well. But when you untether something, it kind of creates new opportunities. And, and I loved what Dr. Sidney said too about, it's almost like this, I call it the Hadron Collider, this accelerator that happened in 2020. Let's not discount, it's a humanitarian crisis, a public health crisis, an economic crisis as well with education smack bang in the middle. But it's also been the Hadron Collider. It's accelerated amplified and illuminated existing inequities, existing challenges, existing opportunities for education reform, which has largely been stalled for decades with pockets of innovation. Now what we're seeing happening at scale is breathtaking across the globe. And Eric, you brought up a good point that I see in my daily life at CAMI is I have principals reaching out to me that say, I know my people are using this for worksheet fill-ins, but how can they be using it differently? What else can Cami do that's going to just change the way they're teaching their students? So every day I'm like, let me show you. you <laughs> and then they're they're dumbfounded by the capabilities and it's not just a worksheet fill-in. And, and Stacey, Stacey gave a great idea for that. that you know, moving to asynchronous pathways when we think about blended learning, using tools like Cami in station rotation, choice boards, playlists and part of the flipped classroom. Yep, exactly. So kind of on that same point, what changes do you all think are going to be permanent, um, whether in the corporate world, the education world, that hopefully when and if we get to go back to normal, um, what would change when we're shifted back into that full classroom environment or if we have to stay in this hybrid world for a while, um, what might be permanent? I. You know, from a corporate standpoint, I think, and I think it may translate into, or you know, other organizations as well, is at least in the corporate world. Given many companies had to reevaluate their brick and mortar assets, so their their physical assets, buildings and things. Given there's going to be a few less buildings they're going to have now, in fact, it may create the pressure to continue on this journey of transforming the democratization of learning and using technology to better um, create uh, the kind of learning environment that Eric's talking about in corporate as well, um, breakout rooms, getting comfortable with that. The other thing I think it will change is perhaps at a, from a corporate standpoint, business leaders understanding that you can deliver a learning outcome that's equal to or better than the old way we did things. Um, so I think those are the two things I believe, at least in my experience, that may, as it, as it relates to a cor corporate environment, um, hopefully stick. <laughs> you know, it's hard because I think there's a lot of things that we want to see change and we're unsure of, you know, whether or not we will follow through. But I think one thing, and I think my colleagues would agree, one exciting change that I think is going to stick 
is we've realized how important a learning management system is to continuity and consistency in the remote world. You know, whether you're using Canvas, Schoology, Google Classroom as your LMS, you know, to really ensure equity, we've seen, I mean, before the pandemic, it was just putting on content, worksheets. Now, I mean, I'm seeing it a part of, you know, a, a blended approach. So I, I think that's really, really important. Also, you know, really thinking about time. What I would like to see out of this is getting rid of seat time, Carnegie units, the traditional school calendar, because we've seen how kids can flourish and adults can flourish if we get rid of those rigid structures. Yeah, I think also just providing platforms for all different students to express themselves. So I think that it's been, we've seen it loud and clear that some students, um, you know, they will speak up on a Zoom. Some students, it's all in the chat and you give them, you open up that chat and all of a sudden you're like, wow, where did that come from, you know? And why aren't we always providing a chat for them? For the ones who need a moment to formulate a response, who might be better typing it out before they say it out loud. Um, you know, I think that it's only been amplified the problem of like sometimes just like calling things out as we've experienced a couple times when we've talked over one another already today, you know, and it, it feels like you're like, oh, I don't want to say it so quickly next time because I don't want that to happen again. You know, it's just amplified on the video where you literally cut that person off. But that was happening in the classroom and how are people feeling? So I think that opportunity to create platforms for all different uh, students to share what's in their head and it doesn't just have to be verbal on the spot. And Stacy, thank you. I'm not going to cut you off, but you provided a perfect segue. Um, I think viewing social and emotional skills as fundamental and not ornamental is one of the durable shifts that we're going to see moving into the beyond the blast zone of 2020 as that ripples out across 2021 and 2022. Um, and I think along that, what we're seeing is this, we're going to see this reprioritization of skills um, and if you like skills and also dispositions. Here's something that's really, I found really interesting. There are some students, many of them have been very successful across 2020 and the Education Endowment Fund in the UK did a study to ask, well, why were these kids successful? And they were successful because they happened to possess a certain set of social and emotional skills that allowed them to deal with the complexity and the ambiguity and the change and to deal with others in a social setting. At the same time, McKinsey and Company Global Institute released a study in April of HR professionals across the globe asking what skills were missing right now in the workforce, right now from the perspective of HR professionals. And as I looked at these two unrelated lists, it seemed the exact skills and dispositions that successful students in 2020 possessed were exactly the same set of skills and dispositions HR professionals did not currently have for the world of work. So again, going back to that Hadron Collider kind of metaphor, it seems that we're being given a glimpse of how we might need to reprioritize skills um, for the future, not just of work, but the future of civic participa uh, participation and contribution. And Mark, you're always segmenting me right into the next question, because the next question is, <laughs> How do we think um, we need to transform and redesign the whole learning process or curriculum to prepare, like you said, for the workforce or for, for future crises? And what kind of support do we need to provide um, to teachers or workers? And I know teachers are PD overwhelmed probably by now. I know they were pre-COVID, pre um, but what kind of support could we give them to help transform the way that classrooms may look or work workplaces might look? And um, because that's such a big question, if I get in <laughs> quick, I can provide a brief answer and then I can then I can rely on uh, on the experts in the room to pad out the details. Um, my number one tip here in what do we do is look for the root cause of success. In education, it's easy and in business to take a deficit model. How have we been broken? What's busted? How do we fix it? 
And that mindset, that fixed mindset, can sometimes limit us from finding where the opportunities are, where the innovation exists. So my recommendation, whether it's in classroom, school or system, is to find who has been successful, how have they been successful, what's the root cause, and get more of that, rather than a deficit view, which is we all need to be doing something different. That different thing is probably already happening somewhere. Find it, codify it, amplify it, and take it to scale. You know, as I, I think about the parts of that question, you know, I, I kind of go back to something else about a lesson learned and what we hope to see. Traditional schooling did not work for all kids. And what I really hope is that we have remote options for all students because they have thrived. You know, also trying to weave in, you know, all everyone's thoughts about what learners need, you know, and, and moving from skills to competencies. And as we think about competent learners and competent workers, you know, we know creativity and, uh, you know, critical thinking, problem solving, that'll still be there. But with so many companies going remote, students need to be competent in remote collaboration, time management, self-regulation, mm -hmm. and emotional intelligence. <laughs> and to the other piece, in terms of training, and, you know, I I'm hoping that I will, you know, uh, set the hook for Stacy to pick up from here because she's in the space right now. She's in a school. I, I think that we have to model the conditions under which teachers and leaders work. You know, when we think about professional learning, so much is one and done, drive by, you know, it's not replicating remote, hybrid, it, it's not focusing on evidence. But again, you know, I always defer to those people that are in the school. So I hope Stacy will pick it up right there with the professional learning piece. Um, yes, absolutely. You know, and I think there's so much power in modeling through the professional development what you want to see in the classrooms or ideas um, so that, you know, because um, a lot of my work is creating the professional development for the teachers that I work with. And so I love whenever I have an opportunity to allow the teacher to feel, experience the tool from the lens of the student, because so often they're just looking at it from the teacher end. So what does it feel like to first be a student so that I have that level of empathy before I start using this tool in my own classroom? And um, this year, I've done a lot of the professional development asynchronously, and it has been so cool to see how many people have engaged with it and engaged with it differently. Again, it's just like providing that time and space so they're able to do it when they're most ready for it. So a lot of them have done a month long, like you engage with this when you find the time for it. Um, and, you know, we have check-ins, whatever they need, and they just follow up with me. But sometimes, you know what, in that month that, that I was offering that, it wasn't the time for them. So we did one at the beginning of the year for Cami, And you know what, it didn't sync with some people. And then other teachers who were using it. The teachers were able to see, oh my gosh, I want to be able to do that in my classroom too. Now let me go ahead and take that PAMI course because I'm ready for it now. And then my role is there to be support. So I'm there to coach um, along the way to help you lesson plan, to brainstorm, to make sure that going back to like just digitizing the worksheet, how are you really using this tool um, in its full capability? Are you using it to provide really effective feedback? Are you using some of the voice features so that you can, you know, really help coach that student along because that student needs that. Another student might be better with the text. Do you know your student? You know, and just have those conversations. I'm lucky to be at a school where I'm able to support teachers in this way. A lot of schools don't have that. Yeah, that's awesome. Anyone else have any um, other ideas on transforming the way that we're in the school or work environment? I, I think for me, uh, what we learned is, and again, it's a we learn because oftentimes, at least in corporate, you've got the, the learning function um, and then you've got the business kind of wrapped around it. And, you know, at the end of the day for the business, it's about the outcomes. Um, I think what we learned is 
you know, there are many programs, if you will, that were pretty long. And as part of my responsibility was trying to, the overarching strategy is how do you reduce time to proficiency? And Eric, you would say competency. And what we discovered is during COVID, oh my goodness, it's amazing that we could actually get people uh, reduced the time to proficiency by, you know, 80%, right? Because we need people to be competent like yesterday. We don't have six weeks <laughs> to train people to be competent to answer a phone, right? <laughs> or to do, to check in a bag or to check in someone at the counter. Imagine that we can actually do that in, in, in a very small um, amount of time and the individual actually be competent enough to actually do the job. So I think hopefully back to what will stick as a result of that, the, peop the, the business and corporations recognize it's not about a bunch of content that will make the difference for the learner. It's specifically what they need, to your point, Eric, when they need it um, and for what they need it for. And I hope and pray that that actually will stick. Hey, Dr. Sydney, you, you mentioned something really important there, which was that, you know, listen and listen some more. Often in as people are planning this kind of education reimagined step, you know, in their, their rush to, to visualize what might be best, uh, sometimes they forget to ask the learners what they think would be best, what they miss and want the most. Um, we just finished a, a survey which um, is bits have been published um, and more is coming down the line where we asked kids, you know, thousands of kids across a number of countries to reflect upon their experience about what they missed the most, what benefits they found, um, what they would like to see in terms of learning moving forwards. One thing that came through really strongly was the critical function, the role of the teacher was being amplified through this. The students were saying clearly, you know, we don't want our learning to be automated but we do want to have autonomy and we really like our teachers to give us feedback and we love our one-to-one, -one, our close personal connection with our teachers. We want that. We want more of that. So listening to the learners uh, and valuing that they have perspectives about how they learn best and what they see as important is critical because we know that, you know, emotions are the gatekeeper to cognition, attention and motivation. And going back to what I said at the start, to be seen, to be heard, to know you matter, if we ask the learners themselves and then we take action upon the things that they say, then as a result of that, engagement increases, motivation increases. And that also brings me to kind of to the next point of um, kind of looking at the social and emotional learning aspects for students and teachers. Um, we all know that everything that happened right as COVID hit was quite a burden and people were stressed and they kind of continue to be stressed. So how do you think incorporating social and emotional learning or any other well-being programs can help schools, communities, or organizations help create and maintain that positive learning environment? Well, I like what Mark has been talking about. I actually wrote this down um, to be seen, to be heard and know you matter. I think that's important, even with, you know, the the increased use of technology. I think one of the things we did here do in the midst of our own lockdown in, in, in New Zealand is, you know, as a as a lead, we create there was a um, app, not an app, but a notification system created that you know, I would get a notification on a scale of one to five, Sydney, how are you feeling today? And so if I put one being not so great and five being great, if I hit, if I click one, it immediately goes to my manager and my manager would give me a call. Sydney, how are you doing? Right? If I'm great, then I'm not going to get a call. But the point is, yes, we're in lockdown. Yes, we're using technology, but making and using a phone is technology too, but making that phone call having a personal connection with your people just to, to, to reach in and see how they're doing. I think for us, that really made a difference because it's a personal touch. It's the same kind of a 
approach that we would use for a customer, you know, three touch, three touch where a customer feels like, oh, they're paying attention to me. They're listening to me. They're connecting with me. And that means something to me. So therefore, I'm probably going to fly Air New Zealand again because they really connected with me. And that is one of the things for Air New Zealand we're lauded for, the customer experience, because we do exactly that. And we try to take that same approach and connect better with our employees during our lockdown and since, quite frankly, because that's a practice I think that the leaders recognize, you know what, that's a great idea. We should keep that up. Because the employees, to your point, Mark, the employees, they appreciated that. So let's just keep doing that. <laughs> One of my favorite topics to talk about is how we can use technology to really deepen our relationships um, and connection with our students. I feel like technology has allowed me to identify so many different student needs that I wouldn't have been able to in the same way before. Um, for example, when I start my lesson and I start it in Pear Deck, I can do something very simple, um, just like, you know, a check in, how are you doing today? And I can get that sense of how they're doing. When students aren't answering the Pear Deck, I can see it tells me right at the bottom of my screen who's not responding. And, you know, that's not um, a way to punish the student because, you know, you're not responding to it, but it's an opportunity for me to have a follow-up conversation with that student and see what's going on because there's usually something going on. And so again, it's that idea, um, we'll go back to that idea of like, I see you, I hear you, you matter. Like I, I see that you didn't participate today. I know that you normally do, like what's going on? And so then when I follow up in that way, when I realize it right away and follow up with the students, they know that, you know, I'm doing it because I care and it's in their best interest. And that's another way that we start to build trust there. And I just think there's so many different, again, like how do we hear from all different voices? How do we hear from all different personalities? How do we make every student comfortable responding in a format that best fits them. When I was a student in the classroom, raising my hand, being the first one to respond, I mean, that just is not the best format for me. I mean, even today, like I love doing a conversation like this, but I know that I'm not fully present for everything that every person is saying here today, because at some point you say something that speaks to me, I know that I want to speak next, and I start formulating this response in my head. And so I'm not totally hearing everything that you're saying anymore, just because that's that's the way that I am. If I was able to type some of this stuff up before, I would make the contribution different. So it's not to say that it's not very important for me to still have this skill, because it is, but sometimes just providing different platforms so that my best, like I can always be at my best and I can always hear at my best, um, just recording this. I can look back on this recording later, you know, so that's going to help me as a learner. Maybe for other people, they just don't need that. So anyway, I'll move along to the next person. <laughs> you know, as I, as I listen to everyone, you know, the, the, the common thread is empathy and, and how we mm -hmm. lead and learn with an empathetic lens. And as I'm listening, you know, the key terms that come to my mind from uh, everyone is compassion, grace, but also flexibility. I spoke to a student two weeks ago and I never had this opportunity. And uh, it happened because a teacher was showing me first semester grades. And the first semester grades were not good, 20, 30, 40. And then she showed me the second semester, and this was in high school math, 99, 97, you know, 80. And so, I didn't know what the student's grade was at this time. And I, I said, hey, do you mind if I ask you some questions? Because that's how I learn. I wanna really learn what's going through the students, teachers, and administrators I work with. And she said, sir, I really struggled. Um, I had to get another job to pay the mortgage. A family member got COVID. Another family member of mine passed away. And I just could not focus in the remote environment. And then I said, well, you're here now. What turned it around? My teacher cared. My teacher showed up for me. My teacher believed in me and the school was flexible. This girl's grade right now is a 97. The first semester, it was a 35. 
It's not that that kid can't learn or did not want to learn. But when we think about the SEL needs, we have to take a step back. And this comes back to looking at entrenched practices such as grading, homework, how we use time. Because in math, you have to be able to have that foundation as you go through. So, you know, as I listen to all of you, I wanted to share that quick story because I think that flexibility is so, so important as well as grace and compassion. That's a good one, Eric. That that actually came up on the, the survey result when we asked teachers what they needed based on 2020 to know more of. And they talked about, we need to know about the complexities of our students' lives, not just their academic capacity. And in a sense, it's this notion that the learning environment needs to be much more invitational, not just instructional. Instruction is not bad, but it needs to invite the whole experience of the learner in. And Stacey talked about that kind of active listening you can do, the emotion check-in at a class. What technology lets you to do is to engage in listening at scale. And there are really mind-bogglingly exciting examples. Surrey School District in Canada that basically has listened across its entire district to find out how happy are their schools. And they have a heat map of happy schools because they know where there is positive education, there is a corresponding positive outlook, there's greater engagement, there's academic achievement, there's a reduction in bullying behaviours, there's you know, a whole host of positive life benefits. A couple of comments I'd make on the, the cell area. It's a, you know, an area of great passion um, you know, of mine personally and, and of Microsoft's. You know, before COVID, it was an issue, right? I mean, World Health Organization identified de depression as the number one global disability, literally disabling people from contributing and living lives to their full. Um, one in five students before COVID identifies having a mental health issue, and that's across all countries. We engaged in a global survey with The Economist around well-being, and we found globally approaches to develop social and emotional skills are in high demand by teachers, but they're in low supply. And largely to Stacey's earlier point, it was challenges around being able to successfully integrate the development of social and emotional skills into learning. So it becomes part of learning itself, not as an additional thing. So one thing that I would call out that I think is interesting is we all want people to collaborate well. And 2020 showed us that sometimes that was good and sometimes it wasn't so good. And Stacey gave us an example about sometimes we listen to respond, sometimes we listen to understand. You know, collaboration is complicated. It's much more complex than sharing a pencil pot or a virtual pen. It requires self-regulation. And self-regulation is complicated. It requires you to be self-aware. Being self-aware is complicated because it requires you to recognize, understand, accurately label, express your emotions, which means you need to have an emotional vocabulary. So, you know, this is where social and emotional learning is, as I said earlier, it's fundamental, it's not ornamental. And, and I'm really hopeful and optimistic that this is going to be one of the accelerators of 2020 that casts education reimagined forwards um, into 2021 and beyond. Thank you, Mark. And just to go back to what Stacy said about being able to check in with your students, I think back on my days in the classroom as a kindergarten teacher and having 25 five-year-olds running around all day, every day is very hard to check in with each individual kid. And so kind of where we've found ourselves in this remote world is it's a little bit easier online um, because you can see those little things as they're not responding or maybe their grades are not reflective of who they are or how you've seen them grow. So thank you all for all of those great points. And we are getting close to our end of our time together. And I just want to thank you all for this great discussion. Um, I think we can all be very confident in knowing that things are moving in a positive way. Um, as 2020 moves on. And just to sum it up for everyone, if all of you would like to share one takeaway from this session, I know we have marks with I see you, I hear you. Um, but if anyone has one takeaway that we would like to share with the audience. 
Mine is going to be be empathetic, but focus on prevention, not recovery. Mine is a simple thank you. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being there for your kids. Thank you for being there for each other. Uh, thank you for all that you do to balance your personal, your professional lives. Uh, because I, I think those of you that are in the trenches in education, you've shown the world that why education is the noblest profession and how important it is uh, to success in, in a global economy. So thank you, everybody. Um, you know, for me, I would just say, how are we creatively um, looking to technology to provide platforms for all students to really express themselves and then also opening up opportunities for them to share in a way that they need to share and that feels comfortable for them. Cool. And, and I would just say to, to the educators, you know, joining uh, Kami Connect, you know, practice self-compassion. Um, you know, this is 2020 was tough. 2021, we're feeling more optimistic, but we're still cautious. Um, let whatever it is that you've achieved this day to this point, let that be enough. Practice self-compassion. I love all of that. And thank you, Eric, Stacy, Dr. Sydney, Mark, all of you for joining me today. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. If you want to hear more from our panel or ask them more questions in the future, you can follow them on Twitter and you can read more about them on our Cami Connect page. Thank you all so much for tuning in.